Hello, everybody, and thank you for making it here live tonight. We are live with Sarah Stevic, and most of you probably already know Sarah, but if you don't, then you are in for a treat. Um, Sarah is like the best person for helping teachers transition into instructional design. Like you've probably seen her name all over LinkedIn if you're on there. Um, but and we've we've collaborated with Sarah before, so we're back at it again. And tonight, the conversation is all about how to prioritize your skill building for instructional design. So, Sarah, can you tell us a bit about how you how you came up with this? Because again, this is Sarah's idea. Sarah came to me with this. So, um, yeah, where did this idea come from? Well, first off, thank you for that lovely introduction. That was very kind. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I'm Sarah Stevick. Uh, a lot of you may know me from teaching a path to LND, which is our group that uh, helps teachers transition into instructional design. And this is a question that I get pretty frequently. And when I look back on my own journey of how I transitioned, when you walk into this idea of, hey, I'm going to take on a new career, especially if you are really well established in your current career, you feel like you have to be an expert and know all the things. And because this is a practice, there are so many things uh, to learn and know. Um, so I thought it would be a great idea to work with, uh, you know, one of the best in the industry as far as putting content out there and helping people as far as just, hey, how do I sort through this? How can I go from being inundated to being actionable? So yes. that's where it came from. And that is what we are here for. Yeah, we see it all the time. You know, those questions, I get them all the time. Like, do I need to know how to code to become an instructional designer? And like these kinds of questions, we're going to sift through all of that um, tonight. And as we found when we were like brainstorming for this and we're like listing some of the skills, it's like, well, some of this is going to be a discussion, like a lot of it will be. It may depend on the, the role or the specific job you're going for. Yeah, you mentioned that Yeah, most most people probably know you from teaching a path to L&D, and that's the group that you run. We should also mention that it is completely like free and volunteer led and just a really supportive community. So if you're not there, we are going to share a link to go ahead and, and join that LinkedIn group. But you're also on YouTube and and all over and a website and all of that good stuff a slack community you've got it all <laughs> we but, do yeah and you can find it all from that website um www.teachlearndev but if you join our linkedin group we're dropping links all the time it's a community where it's just a safe place to come and learn and ask questions and be around people going through a similar journey and so yeah we welcome everyone even if you're not a a teacher, teacher and we get those messages all the time. Hey, I'm in, in HR, but I'm really interested in this trans <laughs> transition. But like, yeah, come on in. Water's great. Nice. Um, so. All right. Good stuff. Um, okay. So we prepared a question for everyone here. And I know our friends in Europe aren't with us tonight because it is late, right? It is a late session, but we do want to know how many people here are already instructional designers and how many of you are still working on the transition. So I just shared a poll. If you could take a minute to answer that. It's quite simple. Are you an instructional designer? Yes or no? <laughs> um, and if you are an instructional designer and you are here, some of you reached out to me just because you are new in your role and you want to like make sure you're focusing on the right things for upscaling. But I imagine that some of you are here too just to kind of um, help out, share your perspective, and that is very appreciated here. Absolutely. I love that you brought that up. Um, so. The conversation that we're going to have today, I would love to say, you know what, there's a very black and white, you need to learn all these six things and these five things, You, yeah, it's good to know. So if you have time, and then these three things, you know, save them for labor. That'd be great if we could say that. <laughs> um, yeah. But it is subjective, you know, and I think with everything, always get multiple sources, always ask different people and find the trends find the trends. So yeah. if you have a differing opinion, please, by all means, put it in the chat uh, and, and provide reasoning why so that we can understand and, and use that um, to grow. You know, we're, we're always going to have a better perspective when we're able to be exposed to other people's perspectives. Yeah. 
Speaking of which, why don't we get the chat going? I, I, I appreciate all these introductions. Seems like we are all over the States. Um, Nigeria too. Sure. Welcome, welcome. So um, why, don't we, why don't we put in the chat, yeah, what skills come to mind when you think this is what an instructional designer does or these are the things that I need to, to learn how to do? Like what are the skills that come to mind? And just as like some idea starters, maybe think about some job descriptions that you've read or perhaps you've gone to other webinars and they mention different topics or maybe in an interview they've asked for specific skills. Um, you know, this inspiration can really come from anywhere. All right, mm, we're getting some, some good ones. Answers. You got problem yeah, solving. We, yeah, we're but... seeing the big ones. Addy, Kirkpatrick's learning theories. Yeah, action mapping. Oh, good one. Yeah. Engaging Visual communication. Yeah. F by PowerPoint skills. Okay, okay. <laughs> you got to love the preach and teach. <laughs> preach and teach, yep. <laughs> Graphic design skills, multiple learning software. management systems. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. Managing SMEs. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Emerging. Communicating with clients. Mm -hmm. UX skills. Good. Authoring tools without investing big money. You're talking my language. If it's full free, it's for me. <laughs> Accessibility. I like that. Inclusive design. Yep. Hand in hand. Client I'm just taking notes of all these. Yeah. Setting expectations, good. This is great. Empathy, I like that. <laughs> it could help you in uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of fields, just in life. Empathize. <laughs> but, now, what you teach will transfer to on-the-job performance. That's a tricky one, um, but so super important. We're going to talk about that definitely tonight. Change mm -hmm. management, human-centered design, lots of problem solving. That's great. Yeah. All right. These Excellent. are negotiation. Thank you, Six. Oh, good one. Okay. Wow. Well, we can just keep this going I, all night. It seems like it just keeps coming, but these are, these are really good. These are really good. So I, I guess we're going to spend the next uh, 50 minutes or so trying to break these down into different categories. And um, there are a few different ways we're going to categorize them, right? We have like four main buckets. So we're going to talk about the theories and principles, um, the tech skills, what we're going to call like the job specific skills and soft skills. So those are kind of the main um, categorizations we've come up with. And then within these categories, we're going to try to break it down even further. What do you need to know? Like what should you probably be focusing on first within this category if you're trying to land that job or like be successful on it? And then we have good to know and nice to know. So this is kind of like a ranking factor, like need to know column, most important, nice to know column maybe delve into that once you're like comfy in your job and interested in it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree with that too. Yeah. For the need to know, there's definitely going to be items that without this skill or capability, it would be very difficult to procure a position as an instructional designer. But I do think it's important to really call out here an instructional designer is made up of a large body of skill sets, right? It's not just, oh, I know articulate storyline, so I'm an instructional designer, or I know how to storyboard, I'm an instructional designer. It's putting all of those pieces together and being able to manage a project from start to finish to be able to deliver a effective product, right? So, we're gonna go ahead and get started with some theories and principles. There's a couple that Devlin and I have brainstormed about and that we brought to the table, but we always are big fans of collaboration. And so we're gonna go ahead and put a little break in the chat so that we can see everything <laughs> to yeah. put in there. So go ahead and drop in theories and principles that you've heard about that you're wondering where and when should I learn this and why? So love that first one. We're gonna go with that. We're gonna do our best to really get as many as we can. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and start with adult learning theories. And we will share this after the um, session. So everyone will have this, this link. 
spelling at 8 p.m. in Eastern time is really challenging. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. I hope there's no English teachers here. Okay. Um, so adult learning theories. I, for me, would put these in the need to know. The reason for that is because of my experience coming from teaching, moving into instructional design in the corporate world, a lot of times teachers get asked, well, you've always worked with children, so how, how do you know how to teach adults? Um, there's some really great videos on YouTube. There's some excellent LinkedIn learnings that you can access for free that cover adult learning theories and what we call andragogy which is different from pedagogy. There's a lot of different science out there suggesting that these actually are not all that different. And I would actually tend to agree, but that's another story for another day. Um, the main thing here is pulling them away from age and really focusing on when we think about training, we think about what do I need to know right now in order to do my job. If it's extra fluff, I ain't got time for that, right? Like time is money, especially in the corporate world. So for, for me, because I was always asked this in interviews, I wanted to make sure I knew about adult learning theory and I knew that I had experience with it and could relate it back to my teaching experience. So an example of that would be uh, I've led professional development events for teachers, so train the trainer events. I've also had a student teacher, so I've mentored and coached in developing the skill set of facilitation as well as planning and project management. So what are your thoughts, Devlin? Because I know you, you do more yeah. freelance and contract. Yeah, so and, and for everyone, if anyone is new to like the channel or new to our content, yeah, Sarah is coming at this from a teaching background and now Sarah works as an instructional designer at like one of the biggest like financial institutions. So corporate side, very like project oriented. And then I'm, I was freelancing from day one. So I've worked with nonprofits, corporations, um, even, even a hot, well, a higher ed, but like on like a more project driven project. So I've worked across the board, but it's all very project driven. Um, adult learning theories, like whenever I see this, I'm like, oh yeah, this is just referring to like all the other like learning theories, like the adult um, kind of qualifier to me, I was always like, yeah, I'm not sure how to interpret that because I didn't come at this from like a teaching background and I didn't have to fight that stigma that, oh, you were a teacher, so you can only teach kids, which is, which is a real stigma. I know teachers deal with that in this field, but yeah, how, what Sarah suggested, like talking about the times where maybe you've done some coaching or professional development for adults and just emphasizing maybe, yeah, just having that conversation about, yeah, here is how it's different. And I have experience doing that, but I imagine you can talk a lot about how it's very similar too. <laughs> so, um, no, so I yeah. definitely, I, I definitely agree with that. And I loved, uh, a comment in the chat that was so spot on. <laughs> Uh, Cindy, with a laughing, crying face, which I can totally empathize with, how can we possibly know all of these? <laughs> I'm going to let you in on a little secret. You won't. We don't. Yeah. We you, don't. you won't. We don't. <laughs> yeah. It's so much of it, if you close your eyes and really think about your position, your job now, and you think way back to your very first year, on the job and you think about those two together and you compare them they're completely different people doing completely different things because so much of this is learned on the job as you go and to be quite honest a lot of these are just labeling things we already do right yeah good point which takes us to our next one that we have up here which is addy which stands for Go ahead, Devlin. Analysis, design, development, implementation, evaluation. Addy's good. Is huge buzzword. Yeah. yeah. If you're looking into instructional design, this is probably like one of the first things you're going to come across is like top, like, you know, the instructional design model, you know, lots of discussion around that. 
really kind of like a project management like framework but i i think it's a good thing to like explore when you're new to instructional design because it kind of gives you insight into like each piece of what an instructional designer would do um yeah and i i think you hit the nail on the head with it's a nice framework it kind of tells okay at some point during all of this you will do all these things yeah um when i first started looking into instructional design, I really struggled with all of the theories because in my head, I comp I tried to comp compartmentalize them all as, as, okay, well, some companies are going to do this process and use this theory for one project or that project. And when I started to really get into it, I realized it evolves. It really does. So as long as you're doing those components, and you're driving design forward using the principles you are analyzing, you're developing, you're designing, you're iterating. You know, if we want to bring in like another big name is Sam. Yeah. Right? You might see a lot of Sam. Oftentimes, job descriptions out there are copy and pasted from other instructional design job descriptions. So true. Um, yep. And and some of these companies aren't really sure what they want or what their process is for design they just know this is a heavy hitter word so some of these are really just getting exposure to them and understanding what they mean so when people talk about them or ask about them you're make you're connecting the dots in your head yeah i think some of these are need to know not not so much because like when you get the job you're going to be following this process like to a t like step one this step two that like you're probably going to be flexible and working with like the processes the company already has in place or like learning trial by fire and it can help knowing about these things and pulling from them um, but another reason why they might be need to know is because sometimes it's just good to be able to talk about them in the interview <laughs> like i've and these are not as fun of interviews when you're like being quizzed or they're like feeling you out on these things. But, um, and even if you're not being asked, it, sometimes it can be good to talk about your experience and um, yeah, qualify, yeah, talk about your experience and your process in these kind of terms just to give yourself more credibility as an instructional designer. Absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the ones that I see in the chat is constructivism you know we learn about behavioralism um and really figuring out what are we trying to do here right again this is another label for what we you know are, are trying to achieve so i would say that's a need to know definitely um what what are your thoughts on that one devlin yeah, I haven't talked about this one very much. Um, I remember it from like my my education days and constructivism. That's like, yeah, where you're like kind of what like building knowledge, like experimenting and like learning as you go, basically. <laughs> like, is that the idea there? Like, I think of like scenario based learning and these these kind of projects I like to do where you're kind of making mistakes and learning from them or yeah, it isn't like constructing your own knowledge instead of being like force fed it. Um, if I'm off on that, then I guess um, I didn't need to, I didn't need to know it. I didn't need to know it, maybe. <laughs> but <laughs> behaviorism, well, yeah, that's oh, go ahead. No, no, you're good. Um, yeah, and I think you know, with with these, it's all about what are we trying to do, right? So when we think about in corporate, at least in my experience, we're trying to change a behavior or learn a new behavior in order to do our jobs better. So with our designs, we have to make sure that we are streamlining them to eliminate extra information, which as a teacher, we learn for different reasons when we're in school. We learn for knowledge acquisition and being able to you know, show mastery of different concepts. Um, so I think that is an important distinction if you're making that move from teaching into instructional design that really hone in on why are we making this training? Should this be a training? I think that's really important too, is being able to identify what items should be a job aid versus an email versus a full blown training and yeah. why. So, um, Sam is another one that we see here. 
So I would say for all of these, and you're not gonna, you're probably, don't, don't hate me for this one, guys. These could fit in any of these categories because you're gonna need to know enough that you can talk about it. A great way to go about this is just look up adult learning theories, look up instructional design theories, and read up on a few. Take a few notes. When you see a word that you don't know, Google it, put it into LinkedIn Learning, put it into YouTube, learn a little bit more about it, and build that knowledge base. Uh, the more you can interact with the information, it's going to stick, right? That's, I mean, that's the crux of what we do as instructional designers, right? We know that when we interact with information, it sticks. So use these terms in what you're doing. If you're currently a teacher and you are writing up a lesson plan, maybe actively think about, okay, what part of Addy am I doing here? Right? How can I connect this back to what instructional designers do? Um, yeah. How could I change this from student and knowledge centered to action centered? Yeah. Addy, I would say out of these is probably the one you'll be talking about most often in the instructional design space. Um, I'm going to add a couple more here that are really hit home pretty hard in like master's programs. Um, I saw someone talk about the dick and carry model and that's like backwards design too, like objectives right into writing your assessment and then designing your practice activities and then like information that you need. So a lot of these are like presented too. It's like there are different ways to do Addy. Like Addy started like super rigid, like do each of these steps in each of these buckets before moving on to the next one. But there have been so many different like versions of Addy and different like this process. It all happens at the same time. This one, you go through it in a different order. Um, but it's, yeah, if you can, yeah, read up on them. Like, yeah, maybe you could try like backwards design is a good one to try. Like, I think that's a good exercise for new instructional designers. Like, what are my learning objectives here? What are my assessment questions for these objectives? And then like, what do I need to do to like help people get from here to, to here? Um, yeah, and, yeah. I, and I think too, this might be a question that's kind of burning on people's mind. So how much time should I actually spend and devote? You know, we all have a different amount of time that we can devote to our, our career transition journey. If you're not currently working, this should be your full-time job as far as like upskilling and practicing and networking and all that. But if you are currently working, you're going to have to budget your time very strategically. So to me, a great like rule of thumb, start here, right? Go through, learn a little bit about the theories you may or may not remember them. Do what one LinkedIn learning about, you know, the instructional design theories. Go through one LinkedIn learning about adult learning theories because I promise you they're going to come up in everything else you watch. So you're going to get that exposure. You're going to get that practice and come back to your notes and say, oh, yeah, I remember learning about that. What was that again? And then you're going to get more exposure. So I'd say formally, I wouldn't spend more than three hours of your time going through a training or you know formally learning about these concepts because they're going to come up in conversation if you don't have those um after that listen to podcasts when you're driving to work when you're taking a shower when you're eating put on a podcast and absorb information that way so i yeah, think good from, yeah Go Good suggestions. Yeah, we want to we want to be comfortable talking about these things. Some of them you can get a bit more practical with, like Mayer's principles. I saw someone say that in the chat and I had forgot about that. Those are so good. Like Mayer's multimedia principles. If you're going to be designing e-learning, which you know, most instructional design jobs these days you are, those principles are really solid to apply when you're designing e-learning. They're very actionable. They're not like, you know, it's not like reading literature. It's like do this thing. Here's an example of what doing it looks like. And here's like the bad version of that, of not doing it. So I think I have a video about that. I'm, I, I know there's a really good article. If you Google like Mayor's Multimedia Principles that has examples beneath like each principle, but 
really solid one to look into that's more actionable than the others that you can actually practice with. And I would uh, to say, to piggyback on that, another really actionable one would be a bunch of crap. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. For graphic design, right? We yeah. need to really be cognizant and aware of, you know, contrast, repetition, proximity. Oh, I missed one. And good old alignment. alignment. Yep. <laughs> it wasn't aligned in the correct uh, <laughs> word, or letter order. Um, yeah. That's okay. But definitely, especially if you're coming from teaching, Graphic design is an area that a lot of practice needs to go into. It's definitely um, something that there's a great book out there called The Non-Designer's Design Book. Uh, I know Devlin and I chatted a little bit about this in our, our last chat, and he put a YouTube link to, you know, if you type in basically crap graphic design, <laughs> in in all caps crap you know uh into youtube you're gonna get some interesting results but i guarantee one of them's gonna go over those uh what those mean yeah um, yeah i have a i have a few videos on this just because this is so important and yeah we can put it here under theories and principles but um i i have videos like visual design principles i have like applying them basics and then like common visual design mistakes but good skill to hone just because first impressions mean a lot and Poor visual design can also really hurt like usability and make it harder for people to engage with your your online content. The book is um, the Non Designers Design Book by Robin Williams. Yeah, not not the actor, but the, right. the author. Mm -hmm. So um, it looks like we didn't help out too much with this categorization since they're all in need to know. But um, yeah, you kind of nailed it. With <laughs> they could be organized like. Like I, I, I have some perspectives over which are like most need to know, but. And I think yeah. too, you know, even though these are need to know, they're need to know for different reasons, depending on your background. Yeah. Right? I like that point. Yeah. If you're, if you're coming from a background where you are well-versed in the neuroscience of learning, how people learn, you're familiar with creating your own content and materials and what's effective versus not effective. These are need to know just because they're terms you need to know to speak IDEs. That's what I call it is IDEs. If you are coming from a background where you've never made learning for someone, you do want to take a little bit of a deeper dive and maybe spend closer to, to six hours of formal learning here and really digging in deep. But if, if you have a ed background, I wouldn't like, it's all about the terminology. Yeah. It's more about the language you're using. Right. Yeah. Good. So let's go ahead and head to our next one. The next gonna, big one. Yep. Yeah. This is the one that's ever on everyone's mind. I'm going to go ahead and drop a little separator there in the chat. So uh, go ahead and drop some tech tools that you've heard about. And while you all are dropping those in the chat, we have a question. I feel like I have a beginner's level knowledge of all of these, but, um, and feel a bit of imposter syndrome. How do you know you've studied enough to be competent without the experience to back it up? That's an, oh gosh, that's such a great question. So. I would say if you're able to create an effective e-learning or virtual instructor-led training or instructor-led training where you take the content, you put it into a digestible form with that is driven by uh, evidence-based theories and by best practices. And it looks decent, like it looks like something that if you went to a conference or if you're looking at, you know, Canva or Visme or any of those, that it could fit in and hold its own. And you're able to iterate and give feedback and take in surveys and information and data and use that to drive your design, that's when you know. If you're a teacher, 
your biggest weakness right now is your graphic design component. Like, Guaranteed. Straight <laughs> yeah. Straight um. up. But you know, you can always just practice recreating what you see out there. You know, yeah. if you're looking at your stuff and then you're comparing it to somebody else's and you feel like it's a lower level of graphic capabilities, really push yourself to try and recreate what you see so you get a feel of it and then take those LinkedIn learnings, go on YouTube, watch Devlin's videos on common mistakes. Um, you know, there's definitely supporting evidence on, on how to improve that. All right. So jumping into some of these here, articulate storyline. Yeah, I'd to add that one. That one's just oh, dominating the industry right now. Every survey I do, like hiring manager survey, like survey for instructional designers, storyline is just like in a league of its own of the skills that are either in demand or the skills that people are using on a daily basis. So how yeah. to add that one and need to know. And I, I would have to agree with that. So I think what could be super confusing coming into instructional design from another profession is like, there's this monster list of tools and you see this list and you're like, dude, bro, I don't think I can learn all these in like the month that I have to train. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you won't, you won't. Um, I would say a good rule of thumb is always look to see what the majority of job postings are looking for and mention. If you look right now, like Devlin said, I mean, articulate storyline, I think they're, they're starting to pay people to just put it in their job. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But you know, that one and Adobe Captivate are really the two biggest, what we call comprehensive authoring tools. And these are going to be authoring tools that have a little bit of everything in it so it can create the whole package of an e-learning so it's part video editor it's part slide deck maker it's part audio recorder it's part uh interactive component capabilities um you only need to know one of those okay yeah for me I'm a huge fan of Articulate Storyline because its user interface is very similar to that of PowerPoint. There is a learning curve, but again, LinkedIn learning, YouTube videos. Uh, I hear Devlin Peck has this excellent boot camp um, and <laughs> also puts out workshops for doing cool things in Articulate Storyline as well. So there's definitely ways to upskill here. Please be aware. You cannot learn articulate storyline in a week. This is a skill that will develop over time. You're going to use a lot of main functionalities. And then depending on the project, you might throw in some spicy little actions here and there. But in all likelihood, you're going to forget a, a lot of the different nuanced ones. And when you need to do it again, just Google it how to build a interactive timeline in articulate storyline. If you Google anything as far as like how to da, 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 in articulate storyline, you're going to find an answer because it's, yeah. Yeah. That, that's one of the benefits of storyline too, like the community. And there will be times you're very frustrated with storyline. It's not like Adobe Illustrator, for example, like it, it, it breaks. It doesn't do what it's supposed to. Sometimes <laughs> everyone can probably relate to that if you've used it much. But compared to Adobe Captivate, it is um, like I started with Captivate and when I picked up Storyline, I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is so much faster and easier. So, well, yeah, I mean, Captivate has some strengths. Like I know like for software simulations, it's good. And I do see sometimes people asking for someone who knows Captivate. And I imagine like the competition is a bit smaller. But if, for, if you're looking for full time work and they use Captivate, but you have a Storyline portfolio, like employers understand that the skills are transferable. So as long as you have experience with one of them, like Sarah is saying, you'll be good to go. But if you're looking for somewhere to start, like Storyline is the way to go. <laughs> and I, I can say that with 99.9% .9 confidence. <laughs> so. Yeah, if, if you're not familiar with Adobe products, do yourself a favor and hold off on Captivate. Um, you know, 
it's it's not as commonly asked for as articulate storyline as Devlin was saying, and it is a huge learning curve. I will say uh, there is a little bit more flex power when it comes to Adobe Captivate, um, but you know, I think you hit the nail on the head, Devlin, when you said it's about being able to learn one, and then saying that if you're in an interview and they ask you, you know what authoring tools have you worked with? And you can say, well, I've been working in Articulate Storyline 360. I always write down how many hours I'm spending in the system because a lot of times you're gonna see a request for one year or more experience using Articulate Storyline. If somebody has one year of experience, but they're only working in it for five minutes a month, once a month, versus how many hours that you've put in, Come to the table and apply anyway and say, you know, when they ask, so do you have a year's worth of articulate storyline experience? And you can say, no, actually I don't, but I do have X amount of hours working in it. And here are the work samples that I've been able to build. And I'm very excited about continuing to grow my knowledge on that. Um, so I think that's so super important. You got to emphasize that you're able to learn something new. If you show excitement about that and show that you were able to pick up one and you picked up one recently, I think that speaks more volumes than having certain things memorized or working in a program for more than a year. So. Yeah. Good point. All right. I'm going to start adding some things here and we can yeah. talk about whichever ones we like and you can, yeah, let's, you can let's debate. Oh, okay. I love me some Camtasia. So I had I had a really great question come up on on LinkedIn in um, asking about, you know, I always see Camtasia and I see Beyond, but when I actually got into my job, I'm using primarily like Premiere Rush with Adobe, and you know, that's the thing about video editors. Pick one, learn it, and then later on, like once you've gotten a job or once you've gotten a really good grasp, like your resume is in a good place, your portfolio is in a good place, your uh, content as far as like your knowledge skill set is in a good place, then maybe start learning additional tools. I'd say starting off, you need one comprehensive authoring tool that's very much so referenced in the industry, aka Storyline right now. One video editor, which is heavily referenced. I do see a lot of Camtasia. I do see a lot of Beyond. Personally, oh. Beyond is not my jam. Um, I, but you know, to each their own. They're just rather pricey, um, and they're a very niche look. It's animated. If in the corporate world, not all corporations are going to. Um, really dig into the fact that it's all animation. So, ooh, Rise. Can we talk about Rise for just a second? Okay, Articulate Rise versus Articulate Storyline. Articulate Rise is the cloud version. Or it is a cloud-based authoring tool that is I would say the super light version of Articulate Storyline. It is very can and plug and play. And once you've built one rise, you've built every rise. So I know there's a lot of portfolios that really feature a lot of rise projects. That's great. It's not showing a lot of range. It's showing very much so like Canva or Visme that you can plug and play. I would spend in that two month free trial of Articulate Storyline, I would spend maybe max two to three weeks, maybe. And that includes the storyboarding, designing it, putting it out there, getting feedback, making iterations and documenting your process in that time. After that, move on. You've done it once. You can do it again. Show your range. Show your range. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Devlin? Yeah, same thing. I mean, Rise is like designed to be like super easy. Like you pick up, you can learn that one really fast. It's very templated. So you're kind of like swapping out pictures, swapping out text. Um, yeah, and it's good and it's really popular because it is really easy and it's really hard to like make it look bad. Um, 
Now, if you have a designer and then someone who doesn't know about graphic design skills, one of them is going to look bad comparatively just with because of like contrast and the images we're using and all of that. Um, so yeah, don't spend too much time learning Rise. Like play around with it. Like you can make a really good portfolio piece in in Rise for sure, yeah. but probably not more than one. Maybe don't yeah. do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, the storyline. A... Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was just gonna say the storyline skills. Yeah, there's there's a higher like skill ceiling there. So someone who's unskilled in storyline is going to be like not productive at all compared to someone who's really skilled. You can bang out like a whole storyboard. You can develop that in like a matter of hours. So there's a big range there. So working on those skills are going to serve you much better and and differentiate you much more than if you than if you know Rise, um, yeah. because someone can pick up Rise who's not even an instructional designer and learn how to use it. I would say if I were to use an analogy, because I love analogies, I would say rise is like learning the cha-cha slide and articulate storyline is more like learning ballet as a whole. <laughs> Maybe that's giving storyline a lot of credit, but I think that's true. Like with the context. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And then like free coding, that's like developing your own genre of dance, you know? <laughs> Yeah, there um, you go. That's good. Yeah, there we go. I had yeah. to put it in perspective. Yeah. yeah. Um, so <laughs> Camtasia video editors. Um, Camtasia is really popular right now. You can get a one month free trial. Uh, you'll see it in a lot of people know it. So it's a good name drop. But yeah, so it is. is Premiere, you know. Premiere um, Pro, Final Cut even iMovie like it's like the same thing it's like once you know one you know them all like even more so than storyline like maybe you need to learn okay maybe these keyboard shortcuts are a little bit different maybe i publish a different way but it's still like a timeline video based editor yeah, yeah. as long as long as it has that timeline piece that's the main component and being able to string together bits of content into a cohesive presentation um then you're good to go same thing um, I for me in my job and this is this is where it really starts to get super subjective because it depends on the place that you're applying for it depends on if you're freelancing like what types of projects do you specialize in or take on for me I don't use a lot of uh, Adobe Illustrator or um, Adobe Photoshop I know a lot of instructional designers that do um, I do think it's a good skill to know. For me, I wouldn't put it in the need to know. I would put it in the good to know because it's an auxiliary. Uh, in because you can find stock photos, you can find stock illustrations and and whatnot out there to put into the main authoring tools. Um, but. I know I, I really I'm Devlin I'd love to hear your perspective of it because I know that you have a very different experience yeah so for me I don't think for my very first client project like I, I've used illustrator I work pretty much all the projects I work on are these like illustration like vector illustration kind of projects so illustrator has been like a key part of the the toolkit I would say um, but I, I can definitely imagine people not using that yeah um, LMSs too. I've been seeing some comments about that. Someone asked if it would be a good idea to like learn an LMS like in and out. I don't think you really need to know an LMS like in and out. I think you should get like one LMS free trial, add a scoring package to it. A scoring package is like the output from a storyline course. If you wanted to go on a, an LMS, so learn how to upload a project, learn how to like enroll a test user and add it to your resume <laughs> like really yeah. instructional designers are, most instructional designers are not doing very complex work on an lms the most i've had to do well the most i've had to do on standard instructional design and e-learning projects is like talk to the their person about like oh yeah what kind of scorm version do you need and i'll like change that published setting and storyline <laughs> so and but but yeah go ahead yeah i think and if you don't know what scorm is it's all capital letters s s c o r m man it's getting late um <laughs> but that definitely look that up if you're not familiar with it uh there was a great question as far as free trial. You mentioned getting an LMS free trial. Absolutely. You can use Moodle. Moodle is a free source LMS. You don't even have to pay for it. 
for the full thing. Um, it's like Devlin said, you've learned one, you have experience in one, you've learned them all. Plus, most of these come with a user guide and tell you exactly how to upload everything. Yeah, um, yeah. So I love that. I would, I would spend a large portion of time learning that comprehensive authoring tool. My next biggest chunk of time I would spend learning the video editor. LMS, you can crank that out in like an app, like take an e-learning, go explore one You're, for a day, like Devlin said, upload a project, figure out how to deploy it, and then you're good to go. You get the concept. Um, yeah. Digital adoption platforms. I do want to talk about that, and I definitely want to talk about JavaScript and X API. These are up and coming. Well, this is where we're getting into the nuances and the weeds as far as they're very helpful things to be aware of, but they're not necessary to do your job as an instructional designer. Um, JavaScript, you can use JavaScript within Articulate Storyline, but you don't have to use it. And in the use cases that you do use it, 10 to 1, you can find it already written out for you that you can copy and paste on the internet. Um, I, I definitely agree. That's a, a nice to know is the, the JavaScript digital adoption platforms. I personally think these are the way of the future when it comes to SAS platforms because of the ever evolving change, but it's so much more than just training. Um, and like I said, it's kind of more in the weeds. What are your thoughts, Devlin? Yeah, I agree. I, I have yet to use a digital adoption platform. I've built software sims and storyline for clients, but I haven't done that in a little bit because I think walk tools like WalkMe digital adoption platforms are just getting more more popular. So I agree with your prediction there. JavaScript and X API. It was really nice to know for me because I worked on some really cool client projects. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean like ninety nine point. 5% of IDs will never touch this and will make great salaries, great work-life balance, never diving into code. So definitely not need to know. But if you are interested in that or you have some background in that, there are some really cool, like, yeah, there is a good opportunity to specialize in that and land some cool opportunities. People who have this kind of stuff in their portfolio, who I help like in the bootcamp and stuff, they, they do generally do pretty well, like applying for tech companies and these companies it's like XAPI people do know what that is. They're interested. They're like, oh yeah, like I've been talking to my team about that for years. We'd love to do that. You know about that? You have a project where you can do that? That's really cool. So it's just one of those things where it's like it could set you apart, but it is like just a nice to have thing. Definitely not one of the first five or maybe even 10 things you're going to learn if you're working on your ID transition. <laughs> just yeah. a nice little ad. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that. Like you're already going to be learning a lot. Don't make that a priority but it is a really great thing to set you apart. It is a really fun thing to learn. You can do some really cool things with it. I actually recently downloaded a free app on my phone where I, I, it's like a, it has a little grasshopper or whatever, and it teaches me how to do JavaScript. And it's like <laughs> little games and I only have to do it for like five minutes a day. I'm like, oh yeah. So yeah. you can learn this stuff as you go if you want, but yeah. So, and then yeah. I would also say I would spend, you know, a little bit of time working within a, uh, a sound editor. Um, yeah. you, I, I do notice this with a lot of individuals first starting out in ID, the sound quality of a lot of their videos or some of their e-learnings is not necessarily ideal. Definitely take, take some time to look up ways to, um, you know, really minimize the echoing in your room to be able to apply like a denoiser or, you know, different things like that. It doesn't have to be like music production level, right? It just has to sound clear and, you know, sound professional. So yeah. Yeah. I good point. I've done some I've yeah, done some work in Audition and it's similar, right? It's still a timeline based tool, but there are some different like features and functions you can use to like clean up audio a bit more and endless YouTube tutorials and I'm sure articles to help you with these things. So good way to push yourself to learn the tech skills. Like just before we move on, oh. 
maybe not as effective is like, okay, I'm going to learn this tool now. Like, let's just dive into it. Like, that's good if you want to get an intro, but like I learned really well doing projects. So I'm like, I'm going to try to do this project where I bring in like, you know, these sound effects and I'm going to use storyline and I'm going to post it to an LMS or like whatever it is. Um, it's good learning the tech skills in the context of like real projects. And then you have a, a portfolio deliverable. So absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Completely beyond. Oh, I just want to say one thing about beyond. Cause I know we talked about that. We've been moving fast. Um, I did a ton of beyond work as a freelancer. Well, mm -hmm. Well, my wife kind of did like she's she's really good with it and we like partnered on it, but we we got a lot of beyond work, I should say. So and it's only seems to only be getting more and more popular. So yeah, it's not everyone's cup of tea. A lot of the clients who I worked with it on like they loved it. But yeah, it is like a very it is a cartoony like look and feel. So not for everyone. And it's not very hard to learn. So you don't need to spend like a lot of time learning it. That's for sure. Yeah. And I think, too, with beyond like, again, who do you want to work for? I think this is a, an important question that sometimes people forget to ask themselves is what kind of company do you want to work for? And what do you see trending in that type of company? Um, you know, so for, I do know for Vion, didn't they recently? Nah, I'm digressing. All right, yeah. moving on. Yeah, we'll move on. We'll move <laughs> Here on. we go. <laughs> All right, job specific skills. This is probably all we'll have time for, but we'll, there are some good ones in here that we need to discuss. Okay. So, so I've heard, I'm gonna put this to you, Devlin, while we get some, some con contributions in the chat as far as like job specific skills. I wanna hear your thoughts on storyboarding. Because- My thoughts on- Storyboarding. I'll tell you my, my thoughts on storyboarding. Okay. I'm ready. And I, and this is the freelancer perspective. So when I started off, I didn't like the idea of storyboarding. I just wanted to get into storyline and I wanted to build the thing. I loved like the, okay, I, I use like a very iterative process. Like I would talk to my clients about this. And I realized then like some of, some of like the agencies who I was talking to about this, they were like a little uneasy about it. And I didn't understand at the time. I'm like, this is the future. This is so much better. Like Sam. <laughs> you know that model um and i started making uh, proposing bigger and bigger things and then i was like okay let's do like a branching scenario to like one of my early clients and i just like built that pr prototyping it out and building it in storyline like without a script just like building it all as i went from like an outline basically wasn't the best experience and at some point along the way maybe with this project, maybe with one soon after that, the client requested a lot of changes after the thing was built. And I started realizing like, this is kind of a nightmare. Like, why didn't I like, why didn't we get this feedback on like the text or like the concept before this stage? Like, why am I reprogramming all of this and wasting so many hours? So pretty quickly worked storyboards into my process. And like with clients, it's like, this needs to be approved and like signed off on before we're even going to touch development because and if you're going to change something about this at that point, it's going to cost more money, basically, because that's just a way to protect myself. And I think that's why a lot of like teams wound up doing that, like instruction, like there are some segmented teams where it's like instructional designers, create the storyboard, developers, develop it, and like so on and so forth. I don't think that's super common. I think it's getting less common, but like in development houses where it's like a big agency and they're working with like big clients, I think a lot of them still operate this way. But those are my thoughts. Yeah. And I, I love that perspective because parts of it, like I, I could just see my own perspective of it, like weaving in and out. And it's so helpful to, to hear different experiences with storyboarding. Um, for me and for everyone, well, first I want to pull it back a little bit and say, it's always important to think about your client and always think that they're not learning professionals. So what you're seeing in your head mm. is not what they're seeing and they need it to be very um, concrete. So I do think, especially in the freelance world, and I think when you're working as part of a big team where you're sectioning off and uh, kind of dividing and conquering to have that like very rigid outline and plan of attack is very helpful. 
Um, and I also think it's, it's based on the project. If it's a really small project and it would take you about the same amount of time to build out a storyboard as it would be to just build a first iteration, definitely think about that. Yeah. Um, for myself, I, I find that I start storyboarding and it's taking me the same amount of time that it would to get out of first iteration. And that's when I abandon my storyline and work on the build. But I do have other big projects where we map out the branding, the look, how we are going to kind of structure our activities so it has a cohesive feel if it's like part of a larger instructional program so that that is consistent throughout. Um, so I think it's an important skill to have. I do think practice in it for, you know, watch, do a formal learning, practice with it a bit, make it part of one of your, your work sample projects, and then, you know, move on to learning something new. Um, writing learning objectives. I mean, there's so many different ideas about learning objectives. To True. me, my, my thought on it is if you don't know where you're going and if your audience doesn't know the point of the training, that's really going to be difficult to establish the what's in it for me and why am I here, um, which is a big part of that, again, the adult learning principles and making your content relevant. Um, so also I like objectives because that's what I true back to when I think about content. Is this necessary? Or does this kind of branch off from the objective? Because if I can cut it, I'm going to cut it because that's going to save time and money all around and it's going to be appreciated. Yeah. Like now, now I use more of like an action mapping approach. I don't really spend a lot of time writing objectives, but when I was going through my master's program, like those exercises, like writing objectives, writing assessment questions and like learning, like that you cut the fluff using these objectives. Like these are like your sword, <laughs> like just learning about those and writing those using Bloom's taxonomy. Like that helped me kind of think the most like an instructional designer. So maybe it's not like I'm using it every day on the job now. And that has a lot to do with like, yeah, like writing actions for an action map are very similar to like writing just like really observable versions of objectives. So I guess I am still doing that, but. Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, it doesn't have to be a formal like list of objectives in the beginning. It could be at the start of, you know, if in your scenario base and you say, you know, this is what is going to learn about in this section and then the next session section, it outlines it. So, you know, yeah, I think it's really yeah. subjective. Def and I definitely, yeah. yeah, definitely don't need to like include them. Like, I, I mean, like just writing them for like your design, like, yeah, if it's like for planning or. Not but so, definitely yeah. make sure to, to put in there somewhere to tell your learners what you're going to be learning about that day and why. Um, I have seen some e-learnings that jump right into content and I have no idea what the e-learning is <laughs> even about. Yeah. You know, so um, working with SMEs, this is huge. You're going to work with, as an instructional designer, you're not expected to be the subject matter expert on what you're designing for. So it's so important to develop the skill set of asking questions and ask and going in prepared. Um, SMEs have a limited amount of time. And if you ask the right questions, you can really reduce the amount that you'll have to keep coming back to them. So uh, I definitely say that's need to know, good to know. Yeah. Uh, kind of thing. Yeah. That is definitely an integral part of the job for most instructional designers. And I remember when I, before I had done this, I was like kind of intimidated, like, oh, I'm going to do like a SME interview, but it's really just like a conversation and you're just like learning, like I'm the learner, just come in like knowing nothing <laughs> and just ask questions and don't be afraid to ask questions and just get, get as much as you can. Um, but yeah, yeah. And I, I think too, like, when you're working with clients and when you're working with subject matter experts, sometimes there's a differing opinion that you'll encounter and it can be very challenging. And so it's really working to drive ideas through questioning and understanding, like my favorite question to ask someone is why or what is the purpose behind that idea or intent? Um, 
And remember, you're also there as the learning professional and to provide guidance as far as what your learners need. You are your learner's advocate. So that brings us to empathy and being able to put yourselves in your learner's shoes and bringing that to the SMEs. There's going to be times when they will not budge. And you say, okay, I hear you. We will put that in there. I do want us to be prepared that this might be a result of that, but I'm more than happy to go ahead and put that in. And then they're the client at the end of the day, you know, like, so. Yeah. And you can get practice doing this in like a few different ways. Like, you know, I'm sure you have friends or family members who are like experts or yeah, they have expertise in a given field or subject matter. So that can be a good, a good source. If you're trying to like develop like a portfolio project, you can kind of work with someone like that. And maybe you, you won't have the same pressures that like you would have from a client, because if it's like someone doing you a favor and just talking to you about their jobs, they don't care so much what the final product looks like. But then there are some people who are like, oh, my friend like runs a business and needs this training for their business. That might be a bit closer to what the real world experience would be like. But we are at the top of the hour. I know some of us need to hop out. Should we um, should we wrap it up, Sarah? <laughs> Any yeah, I think, you know, some some parting thoughts. Uh, a, thank you so much for having me. Like, I love chatting this through with you. Um, for everybody who's attended, thank you for coming. I think some really key things to keep in mind here is budget your time. You're not going to learn everything. This is a skill set that is developed over a number of years. Where you start is not where you finish. So please don't put the pressure on yourself to say, I have to know everything because nobody knows everything. A true expert is the person who always says, I want to know more. Good perspective. I like that. And I think a lot of instructional designers can relate to that because there clearly is so much to learn. We probably could have spent like another like four hours filling up these, <laughs> these columns and talking about them. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I think we made good progress and now we covered a lot of ground. Hopefully seeing these perspectives was helpful for you all. And if it was helpful, you should join the uh, Sarah's LinkedIn group, Teaching a Path to Learning and Development. I'm there. I get notifications a lot. It's a really good place and supportive place to be, especially for teachers, but everyone is welcome. So um, I shared a call to action on the screen if you'd like to go ahead and join that group. I think you have to request to join, but we'll make sure you, you get in there if you're not in there already. Um, real quick. I know yeah. we're at time. I promise I'll keep done in a minute. I did see a comment about everything is good to as need to know. <laughs> Got it. Um, I think, I think a key takeaway here is really about how much time you spend on each thing. Uh, so good takeaway for tech, you need to learn one of each to the point of creating an on par level project or deliverable to that of an entry level instructional designer for the theories and methodologies do a little bit of formal learning but you're gonna be talking about it in all the learnings that you do. You're gonna to listen to podcasts. So it's gonna come up again and again. So really think about that strategically and where you're spending time. And that's what's important. Just start learning. Yeah. Yeah, storyline is a good place to start for a lot of people because like you're building something. You're gonna see it come to life. You're gonna have deliverables. You can get feedback on them. And as you're learning about the theories and the models, like you have a way, you have kind of like a mechanism to express those things in, in, a, in a format that's like really desirable in the industry right now in the current job market. So that's a good place to start. Um, but yeah, just being immersed in like the community, like it's such a supportive community. If you are new to the ID community, um, just, yeah, you're going to come across these things on like a daily basis and three months from now, it, you're going to know what all of it is. It's going to, it feels overwhelming in the beginning, but as you're like attending events like this and watching YouTube videos and reading, um, you're, you're, you'd be really surprised how much you can soak up in three months, just being in like these spaces. So, absolutely. so if you're here. Thank you to all of you who are just here to like share your perspective and hang out. Um, I'm also going to share the link to the Jamboard right now in case anyone wants to open that up.
And and look at all of our must knows. I'll look at all the must knows. Hopefully this doesn't leave you feeling more overwhelmed. <laughs> but if you have follow up questions, feel free to ask us. I know our, you know our inboxes are always open. I have a Slack community. We have we have all the communities, all the places to ask. So you're not alone in this. Great support out there. And yeah, thank you for all the thank yous. Thank you, Sarah, for uh, doing this with us. Yeah, no, it was so much fun. And we'll see you all soon and just keep at it. And Devlin, thank you. Gosh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate and admire all the things that you're doing for the community. Right back so. at you, Sarah. Right thank back you. at you. All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Bye-bye for now.